Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ku Salma and this is uh, Cha Time. We have a series called Building Climate Resiliency Through Local Community Wisdom. And today's topic is Past Wisdom, Resilient Futures. The value of reclaiming a low carbon urban site. Our speaker today is Dr. Gwyn Jenkins, who has been living in Malaysia for the last uh, 25 years or more. And she will bring very unique insights to the whole question of built heritage, climate resiliency, and community wisdom. Before we start, I would like to invite Mr. Nguyen Duk Tang from Sicha Board of Directors from Vietnam. And who yes. is also Deputy Director of the Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage of Vietnam to introduce Sicha. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Sama. Good afternoon, everyone. It is very nice to meet you, uh, everyone, again. I believe uh, some of you uh, were here last week on our first uh, event of the webinar organized by Sicha. Uh, my name is Nguyen Duc Tang from the research, uh, Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage in Vietnam. I would like to thank the Board of Directors uh, of the Southeast Asia Cultural Heritage Alliance Sicha again for giving me the honor to welcome you all to this second webinar. So um, it has been one, one year since um, last December, nearly one year, I, uh, when the seven founding members met and to announce the inception of AHA, it's the ASEAN Cultural Heritage Alliance. It's the former name of Sicha as we know it today. It was a really exciting moment for us to discuss and to set forth the mission, the objectives, the membership criteria, and basic working procedure for the organization. We were the founding, seven founding members, uh, including the Indonesian Heritage Trust, the Penang Heritage Trust, the Yangon Heritage Trust, the Heritage Conservation, uh, uh, Converse, uh, Conservation Society of the Philippines, the Singapore Heritage Society, the Siam Society under Royal Patronage, and the Center for Research and Promotion of Cultural Heritage in Vietnam. As a meaningful initiative, CITRA is established in advocacy for the ASEAN Declaration on Cultural Heritage, which was signed by ASEAN in Bangkok in 2000. As a nonprofit organization, a digital-based network of Southeast Asian civil society organizations, Shicha is dedicated for the active engagement in the preservation and safeguarding of cultural heritage across Southeast Asia region. I don't, I'm not sure if you, you, you hear the music in the background, but <laughs> it's annoy, annoying. I asked someone to turn off with the stuff. Sorry for this. Uh, back to Shicha, uh, we, are, we commit uh, ourselves into a three-fold mission. First is to serve as a forum of robust discourse among heritage, among uh, heritage, ASEAN heritage professional practitioners, civil society and community organizations, and interested members of the general public. We are to promote public awareness of the importance of heritage protection as a vital component for national and regional sustainable, sustainable development. Also, Sija would like to serve as a think tank and the resource center to support ASEAN policy and decision makers in cultural heritage through a variety of activities, including uh, research, analysis, consultation, training, seminar, conferences, uh, to highlight the key issues in heritage and heritage conservation, and to serve as a bridge between heritage interest goals of people, of businesses, and governments. CITRA also gears its activities towards the development of heritage management programs in ASEAN to place cultural heritage at the heart of ASEAN community building efforts and to join hands in bringing about creative solutions to protect heritage sites from damaging commercialization and urbanization. These are set forth in the Vientiane Declaration. Today, 
I'm very honored to invite you to participate in second activities in a monthly series, uh, serious monthly talks that we call Tea Time or Cha Time. So under the theme, Building Climate Resiliency Through Local Community Wisdom. So we, we're going to take this uh, monthly. Every month we have a topic. Uh, so the topic today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we know it, that uh, we have uh, Dr. Nguyen to deliver the talk on uh, the topic of uh, past wisdoms, resilient futures, the value of reclaiming a low carbon urban site. You know, over the last decades, the world is witnessing a drastically fast developing world. On one hand, the advancement of technology, modernization, industrialization, urbanization, and the life have brought about a more convenient, a more modern, comfortable life to a large population of the world. But on the other hand, however, it has given a tremendous pressure on our environment and our mm -hmm. own cultural heritage. More carbons and harmful chemicals and gases have been produced, resulting in an unhealthy and polluted living habitat for both human and nature and creatures in the, in the wild. Because of modernity, a wide range of cultural traditions and practices ease in their practice and transmission. The transmission of tra traditional knowledge and cultural practices, especially in urban areas, has been interrupted, resulting in, in intergenerational disruption and crisis of cultural values. The absence of documentation, identification, and recognition of such invaluable wisdom and knowledge that have been practiced among our ancestors for generations deepen the impacts by modernity. So these are the prerequisites for CHA to bring about our second child time session today with the topic past wisdoms, resilient futures, the values of reclaiming low carbon urban site to be kindly presented by Dr. Gwen Jenkins. So before I leave the floor back to uh, Mrs. Ku Sama Nasusan, Vice President of our uh, member, Penang Heritage Trust, I would like to remind you that we, uh, we also have another chart time in November, but the details of this talk have been uh, not uh, informed yet. So we will keep you posted on, uh, on the details uh, uh, about the topic and the speaker through our Facebook page uh, soon. So welcome you all to the webinar. I look forward to the presentation by Dr. Wen, and I encourage you to engage in the discussion. On behalf of the CJ Board of Directors, I wish you all good health and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tang, for a very relevant message. And I think many of us who are in heritage have also been thinking more and more about the environment. And uh, so today's talk by Dr. Green Jenkins is so very relevant. She's the author of the book, Contested Space that Revisited, Georgetown, Penang, before and after UNESCO World Heritage Listing. And this was published in 2019. She's also a board member of Ecomos Malaysia and a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a member of INTBAL, International Network of Traditional Building, Architecture and Urbanism. This talk will last about 30 to 45 minutes. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, please leave your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them in the last 15 minutes of the program. So Dr. Green. Hello. <laughs> okay, let me start to share. Okay, hello everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, uh, Sicha, for inviting me to uh, to participate um, and present this um, topic because it's absolutely vital, um, something we really should be looking at. Um, and so I will, without any further ado, I will keep going. Okay, past wisdoms, resilient futures, the value of reclaiming a low carbon site. Sorry. This uh, 
area here in the photograph is actually an air well. It's the center of a, the building where I'm staying and working at the moment. It is to me the most intelligent and sensible part of the construction. I'm lying on a sofa having just finished a book. I look up and that is where all the hot air disappears and all the cool air and the cool rain comes in. I'm sheltered by a bamboo chick if it's too sunny, but it also allows the air to ventilate through. Whoever designed this, whoever built this, understood the climate, they understood uh, the land on which they were building. And that's something we've lost and something we need to go back and explore. So why is our, why is our um, traditional, uh, uh, sorry about this, why is our traditional built environment so important? Well, at the moment, our Earth's ability to support life is at tipping point and our climate under stress, and it's time to rethink the way we design and use our urban spaces. So how can we remove the complexities of life and return to a simpler, more holistic way of life balance with the elements of modernity? So past wisdoms may offer us a chance for resilience. So we have to ask ourselves three questions. Was or is a historic urban site a low carbon environment? If so, how? First of all, it was built to suit the land. It was built to suit the climate. The infrastructure dealt with the monsoons as I'm in a tropical space and the building form also dealt with this. It was built with local materials, anything that was handy, timber, stone or whatever. It created centers of activity around core sites, reducing transport needs. So you have a place of worship and you have residents around, commercial uh, outlets around, all related to that particular place. And you have markets. And again, the people all around would be interrelated, a lot of reciprocal relationships, and again, with schools. So that reduced the transport needs. A lot of people lived above the shop. We have something called a shop house, um, and that explains itself. And we made reference to local knowledge all the time. So the second question is, how has this pattern changed? Well, now we build to control the land. We pile for height, we uh, realign uh, rivers, we realign the coastline, and we realign the water, we shift natural water flows, we reclaim the sea and the land, and we level hills. There's very little respect for nature, and that's going to cause us, or has caused us, big problems. And we build to control the climate air conditioning, heating, mechanical ventilation, instead of working with the climate. We build with materials that follow a fashion, a trend, and they're energy intensive materials, for example, glass and steel, a mass import transportation needs, but this big business. We create speculative developments in isolation, necessitating car ownership and road networks. So no longer the clusters around uh, particular sites. So this is high transport needs. And we separate work, leisure and rest until COVID-19. And then things have changed, which is quite interesting. But prior to that, we were separating these three. And I think now we're starting to realize we need to pull the three together. And we have a terrible dependency on experts instead of thinking for ourselves and have courage in what we're thinking. So, the third question is, can past wisdoms be part of a resilient future? And if so, how? Well, first, let's maintain, let's reuse existing buildings so instead of always being, uh, building new and leaving uh, existing ones to fall apart and be a scar on the landscape. Let's rethink traditional infrastructures. If you think about Seoul returning to its river network instead of having it as a road network, that's a good example. We build repair with traditional materials. We'll go through why later on. We support traditional cluster sites, reducing transport needs. So in planning terms, whenever we have something, that, um, an area that looks to be uh, beginning to um, devalue of its population, then we can offer, offer grants, et cetera. So we keep these uh, places of worship, these markets, these schools as the centers of cluster sites. We support the creation of living and green spaces. We reduce the need for private car ownership. I always lived in center of major cities and I've never needed to have a car. 
and we value local knowledge. But let's look where I am. Here I am in uh, Penang, which is uh, the name of the state, Penang State. And I'm on this island, which is Penang Island, Pulau Penang, and I'm actually sitting in this place called Georgetown. And this map was, was uh, printed in 1969. This was just as uh, Georgetown changed dramatically because we lost the port and the port was moved over to the mainland. So all the industries, the, um, the businesses that related to port activities suddenly were in shock because everything was happening over here. But all around us, we have rubber plantations, we have pineapples, we have coffee and tea, but I think that must be higher up. Um, we have paddy, the orange one is the uh, rice fields. We have natural forests, and this is our granite hills here in the natural forest. And we have mangroves, which are protecting us from, for example, the tsunami of 2004. Um, and we have uh, mangroves over here. So it's almost a self-sufficient island. It pretty much is actually, because there were also lots of vegetable gardens all the way around, um, which made it very possible to everything could happen in one place. This is what it's like today. We've built up everywhere. Because we lost the port, we then introduced factories. When we introduced factories, we extended the airport. Um, our trees uh, on our uh, hills are constantly under threat. We have a national park over here. Mangroves are depleting. The paddy is depleting because we're now getting a lot of building going on. So everywhere that made this a sustainable um, and self-sufficient island has actually been stressed. Now that actually uh, puts us, makes us very vulnerable. It reduces the resilience tremendously. Where it all started was uh, because we were part of a trading route between um, India and China for the East India Company. And we were freshwater, so they would stop here, and that's when it became um, an urban site. There were people living here already, but the town was uh, started in 1786. So we had influences from India and from China, as well as regional. And we started to build with things that we found in, on the site itself. So this is the, the little town that was built up here. The grid is the brick uh, town. You can see brick kilns on the map here. And on this map, which I'll show you, you can see lime kilns. So we had the basic materials. We had the stone, which is from the, um, the hills we were talking about earlier. The timber was, again, uh, deforesting the hills, but also the mangrove from the swampy area where they were building. The clay uh, was in the riverbanks. Um, there's mud bank here, but that would be too salty. And the lime, lime in those days would have come from seashells. And there's plenty of uh, seashells around this area. But no, this is the built up area after the brick buildings. This is paddy fields. And later on, all this gets built on. So they need to build in a way that will uh, be suitable for a very wet area. The energy of Penang is phenomenal. It seems to be incredibly resilient, whatever happens to it. And very shortly after they arrived, the mud bank became um, reclamation. As the tide moved sand in, people would put some, bricks, uh, some blocks down and build a building on top. So, like fingers from what was Beach Street, the whole of this area grew as the trading port grew. Eventually, the government stopped it by putting um, a granite wall, seawall, called Well Key. So the energy is here constantly. And our influences, what did we get from different places? We had a sort of mix and match. We chose to take the timber of the roof structure from uh, China, Hong Kong. I think actually this pho photograph is Macau, and as Peter's here, you can confirm. Um, so we took our timbers with large timbers running between two walls and then smaller timbers uh, on top. And then the tiles actually tended to be used for temples. We didn't use that tile design for our houses. We used the Southern Chinese uh, shop front. Um, with lots of ventilation through the shutters 
and the ventilation here, as well as the openings. But we didn't choose that to take their method of uh, making lime. Uh, over this region, the lime uh, putty that they use for building was mixed with rice straw, and that's something we didn't take on. What we took on was the Indian version, which is brick dust in our lime. So we mix the lime putty with brick dust and sand, and that came through this part of the trading route. We also took their tiles, but we didn't take the way the tiles are supported. If you remember, we, our big timbers go in this direction and our small timbers go in this direction, top to bottom. So we were completely opposite way round for our structure, but our tiles came from India. There's also something at the back of the houses, which is a terrace called the Madras Terrace. And this um, is where you dry your, um, your foods, your clothes, yourself even. Um, and this was a very cleverly made layering of terracotta um, which uh, was waterproof. And for the Indians, they would have the major timbers close together to the size of the terracotta tiles, but for the Chinese, they had the batten. So it was a design that merged between the two. And this was really what we had. And all of these materials were to hand, they were replaceable, and they were uh, certainly the bricks and the lime was breathable and it was created a sustainable environment and a low impact environment. Because lime <coughs> is one of those materials that absorbs CO2, so it's actually helping what's happening. But as you see, over time, things change. This is a traditional roof. This is a modern roof, but it's the same uh, V tile, as we call it. This is modern glass. This is traditional timber louvers. This is modern tiles. This is traditional uh, air vent tiles. So the mix and match at the moment have changed. This is in between. This is a period of time in the 70s, 80s, when we used um, asbestos sheeting. So it's not impossible to go back to the sensible materials that allow this to be a low carbon site. The terracotta roof allows the uh, moisture in the air to accumulate and it allows cool to come down below. Asbestos roof just heats everything up and so it's a uh, concrete roof. So we investigated all our building materials to see when there was a change. And we realized the first uh, 100 years or so, we were a very uh, breathable environment where the four basic materials, uh, timber, stone, clay, and lime, were uh, used constantly in building. Then came the, 18, the 1900s with the dual tra trade route, and we introduced glass, we introduced cement, uh, the car was introduced, the elevator, the lift was introduced, and it completely changed the architecture and the building methods. But they're all being built on the same swamp. So when you have reinforced concrete uh, columns going into a very wet ground, you've got uh, corrosion and problems many years down the line in the future. So this was uh, the enthusiastic change, but not necessarily the best. Then in by the 90s, uh, the, um, there was a social change, particularly, uh, where a lot of families, the children had educated, went overseas. They didn't want to live in these big old houses anymore. They were difficult to look after. Um, and there were often squabbles over wills, not particularly this one, but uh, others as well. And so the best thing to do with your houses was to actually turn them into uh, cash. So either sell it or you um, develop it. This is uh, a hotel from the 70s. This is a tower block from the 80s. And this was what was happening in the 90s. And this is what we had. We were given back for our streetscape. It's a car park with part of a hotel on the top. It's clearly air conditioned because the glass windows are sealed. Um, it's not the same language of uh, understanding climate as the base. In fact, it's, it feels like a, a decorative little slipper on the foot of a gorilla. But um, that's just my personal opinion. I'm sure the owners love it. Then we realized that the Georgetown itself was a um, highly tenanted area. A lot of speculative building and tenants were living there. And by the year 2000, there was a repeal of rent control. Rents had been frozen since the war. Uh, because a lot of people were um, staying in these properties and they uh, 
because of the financial situation after the war, their rents were cheap and then they re remain cheap. So the year 2000, that was just uh, a time to release it. And what was thought to happen was that we would have lots of tourists, but in fact, that wasn't the case. What happened is we had swiftlets, and swiftlets are birds that um, produce nests that are then processed and then sold to China. And it took a long time to actually get rid of the swiftlets. We, uh, the swiftlet companies, the swiftlet farms from the inner city. The reason we needed to is because they actually do a lot of harm to the buildings. They uh, make the buildings wet so that they resemble a cave. And so the uh, swiftlets light the interiors. And so they hang around in the a nest. So it took until about 2014, I think, before uh, they were closed down. And mainly it got closed because the Chinese didn't like the quality of what was being sent over from Malaysia. And so they actually stopped importing. So we're getting an empty city, we're getting swiftlets, we've sort of got tourists. And then we become a World Heritage Site, or half a World Heritage Site. The other half is Malacca, which is further down south, down the Straits of Malacca here. So this is an empty city, or emptying city, um, just as we become a, a, world, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is what it brings, mass tourism, commodification, and making it impossible for locals to actually live uh, and enjoy living in the site. This is our local bus. He cannot get through because of the hundreds and hundreds of tour buses that we get. This, just the other side of this tour bus is the shop house where I live. I live without air conditioning. It's totally open, traditional, and the filth from their engines running was just unbearable. It was getting to be absolutely horrible. And then this happened. And what a relief for me living there, but obviously devastating for everybody else and their businesses. But it has given us a breathing space, the lockdown of COVID-19. It gives us a breathing space and a time to review the potential of past wisdoms and how they can be part of future resilience. Finally, I could see my neighbors. I didn't realize half of them still lived here because I could never see because of the uh, hordes and hordes of tourists we have. So let's recap of the last 12 years of being a World Heritage Site since 2008 to now. Um, we, one of our uh, criteria for uh, the outstanding universal value was because we had a strong living culture, culture as a way of life. There's a problem with the word culture because in the West, culture means going to art galleries, uh, it's a leisure activity, whereas culture in Asia is, is definitely a way of life and, and your belief systems, et cetera, and your behaviors related to all of that. So this was my neighbor, Auntie Chu. She lived opposite. This is Chinese New Year. She was asked to leave in 2008 her, as we became a World Heritage Site. The property was sold. It's been sold a second time. And I have a very empty Airbnb opposite me now. This is the traditional insurance policy, which you would see everywhere in our streets because we're a very strong uh, Chinese population. And this insurance policy would be like a theater every morning and every festival day when the outside God would be uh, honored and uh, joysticks and tea and flowers, sometimes a pineapple would appear on this little altar in reverence. This uh, little uh, tank here is where they'd also sometimes burn money and send it off to uh, the heavens. Well, these people were asked to leave with a, repair of re a repeal of rent control. And this is what we have now, a very nice, uh, very well conserved um, building, but all its life has gone. It's actually a boutique hotel, but it's, it's living story. There's no connection between the building and the elements or the, um, the spirits in a way. These were sort of spirit houses. But they still kept the five foot way. They've decorated it very nicely, but it's, it's really lost its soul. There's one successful project, and this was actually partly a, a Bangkok organization called Asian Coalition for Housing Rights and Think City, a special purpose vehicle set up by the Malaysian government, um, where they found a, a row of 10 units, 10 shop houses, which belong to one uh, temple, which is actually at the back. 
of these houses. The temple wasn't a very well off one, and so they were contemplating these turning into another boutique hotel. Luckily, Think City came along and asked them to hold on while they had another idea. And this is where a Asian Coalition for Housing Rights uh, with a loan and Think City with a grant discussed with the 10 tenants how they would uh, like to uh, restore their properties. And at first the tenants thought, oh goody, all this money, let, I can have gold taps. Well, not quite like that, but they thought they could do a lot to their properties. But what they learned, what everybody learned was there was a budget there were obviously worse uh, problems uh, in people's houses than perhaps in their own. And they actually came together. They went into each person's house and actually had a look and then itemized which were the uh, you know, first priorities. So then they didn't claim too much because they thought it was free money. They actually worked it out together, budgeted and ended up with a well-conserved row of shop houses and a 10-year tenancy because the owners benefited from their properties being repaired and slightly higher rents. But then this was all happening when uh, tourism was escalating in the area. So that the minute that the uh, hoarding came down, these 10 tenants um, decided to join in with the tourism rush that was happening. And we ended up with the, sometimes they were subletting the front so that they could have these traders there. The whole street just became uh, completely overwhelmed by tourism. And mainly because we have a series of paintings um, which are dotted around town. They weren't even originally by a, a Malaysian, they were by a European. And where these paintings took place, we would have mass tourism and the properties around values of tenancies went up. The locals were asked to leave and new tenancies came in to uh, open up more tourist type shops. So this became an absolute horrendous nightmare and it was all around the town that this was actually happening. So the locals really were, after repeal of rent control, there were a few that remained and those that remained eventually got priced out of town with things like this. There was also uh, a park, which was every night thronged with people, uh, a recyclers market. If you wanted to get rid of anything, you put it outside your house, five minutes later it disappeared. And that evening, after six, you would find it in this market being sold. So it's a wonderful system of recycling. In the daytime, this park was empty and there was perhaps one man reading his newspaper, but it was hot and only one tree was really shady. So he would be there under the tree. And at nighttime, when it was cooler, everybody came out and set up this market. A lot of these people are from the area, though eventually a few were coming in uh, and they made it slightly unpleasant. We had it, the enforcement officers down most days to try and close it. And in the end, it was decided, let's negotiate. And with Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, help the local person become the negotiator. And they, the, amongst themselves, the people in the market worked out how to uh, keep it clean. Um, they set up their own little committee. And I live opposite this, and I tell you, it was fantastic. They really looked after it. It was so much nicer once they, once they got themselves together. But there were other people who thought this market should be for car driving middle class to come and enjoy. And so this is what we now have. The market, uh, sorry, not this flea market, but the park is uh, a place which celebrates plastic flowers, is often filled with film crews and company bonding sessions. So most Sunday mornings I hear testing, 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 as they're trying to see if their PA system works. So gone is the rhythm of the street that we have, and this has nothing to do with the climate, nothing to do with it's cooler in the evenings, it's just an in-your-face plastic um, uh, Thing. <laughs> it's no, no other word for it. Okay, this is where we have the natural ventilation versus the glass and the aircon. And this is because this is a corporate image and this is our unique historic identity. And this one won, unfortunately. But this is not very resilient. When I first came, there was a um, 10 day power cut because the big cable underneath Penang Bridge had burnt out. If, if this happened now, this guy is going to be in trouble with his air conditioned environment. This guy will be absolutely fine if this had been allowed to stay. 
So this is the contest that I talk about quite often. And really, if we want to build resilience, we should respect what we have already. Then also the other problem was a love of big numbers. Um, bringing in the cruise ships, as many as possible. We had a ridiculous number about to come in in 2020. And of course, now they've all stopped. But what were they coming to see? They were coming to see a mixture of a vandalized heritage site, plastic flower parks, selfie wall paintings, and made in China trinkets. So it wasn't a very pleasant site. But in amongst all this was this fabulous community and a very special sense of place that they had. This flower stall is really interesting because just here is a statue of Lord Ganesha, the Hindu god. Just beyond it is the Sri Mariman temple, uh, sorry, the um, goddess of mercy temple, uh, Kuan Yin, which is for the Chinese. And here is a Muslim flower stall. So our three major ethnic groups are all together in one area. And these are their beautiful buildings which represent them. And around them, they would have the uh, businesses and um, living that uh, reflected this is the core site. This one is a, the Hindu temple was interesting because the guy who did all these beautiful figurines on the top actually came from Velour in India, where there are a lot of beautiful temples. And he was a seventh generation of um, figurine um, carvers or makers. But his children were now going to do IT, and he was not working in lime or stone, he was working in cement. So we could see how the changes were happening. We have a very movable city. There's a lot of things going on all the time. This guy is recycling. He's probably going off to that market, but he comes and picks up boxes, old TVs, fridges, old air cons, and he recycles them. From him, I know the cost of metal in, in Japan because he will tell me what's happening on the market. So it's a very interesting neighbor to have. This is also the um, another type of moving uh, environment. It's a food store which will move around, which is quite common in, in uh, Southeast Asia, and it'll move around according to where the customers are. Sometimes you will see this um, in one place and then he may move a few streets over particularly in the business areas, they will move to an uh, evening site. So they're always moving. This is static, but it does have uh, movable stalls outside. This is our traditional coffee shop and incredibly sensibly built with the environment. It's on a corner and the inside is totally open to the elements. You've got this protective five foot way running around. So the air flows through. They have satellite stalls, uh, which the owner of this site will rent a space to. To allow them to operate inside um, and if one of them has a wedding to go to or is sick the others will still operate nothing will close so these have managed to sustain their business during the uh, COVID-19 lockdown they are resilient we also have our uh, placing of our markets this market is um, placed on a north-south route um, it's so that it's shady in the morning when it operates. They have a few little umbrellas for when the sun starts to come up. But basically this is cleared by 11 o'clock and it goes back to being a full street for cars again. This is running in the same direction, just a few streets further on. And this is a big market hall that was re revamped, but they cleared the traffic from, uh, they cleared the stalls from here to allow for traffic because this was going to be a big car park and that was the best way in. The result was they had to put the stalls in a um, east-west road, so they had to build them a canopy over. So you can't see this building. It actually chopped a lovely building in half, so you can't see the half that's really nice, and you can't see the shop houses on the other side, and they still are not protected. They have to put their own umbrellas up. So this, which is a, almost a forgotten street, is perfect for the climate and this which has got too many hands trying to fiddle with the design is certainly not perfect for the climate. Another area we have that deals with the climate is the very large drains. In front of all our buildings we have big monsoon drains. Um, they vary in size. As you see on this plan there's uh, each unit had a little bridge crossing it and then it would have a drain running through. 
This would mean when it rained, you'd get a curtain of water cooling the atmosphere and it would be trundling off down into this drain here. So it meant that the shop houses were higher than the road so that they wouldn't uh, get flooded. This five foot way walkway would be for pedestrians. Um, the houses are actually set back at that level. So this was a very sort of communal area and very well designed. And to make sure that the materials were resilient, you have something like granite um, placed on the, between the road across the drain and up to the five foot way. But over the years, we have had a lot of road uh, resurfacing and this resurfacing just piles up one after the other until we get to the point where it takes up space which would be used by uh, any flood water. So when this gets full, the area between the two shop houses would just fill up until it slowly drains away. But this tarmac is occupying that space. So the result is it actually floods into the houses now. And we have here a guy who's desperately trying to pump out his house um, to um, avoid uh, the water getting in. But in fact, what he's doing is he's putting it into the street. In the street is another drain, which is actually going back into his house. So that water is just recycling. What the neighbor has done is build up their five foot way so that it doesn't get uh, flooded. But this means you lose uh, the um, delicate design of the base of the columns. It also means it's inaccessible. Anyone in a wheelchair or anyone that's not um, that uh, ambulant will not be able to walk there easily. So that's not the solution. The solution is tackling this stuff here. Oops. Excuse me, it's not moving. Right. Um, we have also the uh, situation where some of the properties now are incredibly valuable. They have been restored beautifully and they're under threat of uh, flooding. We also have the problem where we have houses that are uh, much younger than the ones opposite. And the, the older houses tend to be lower. So every time it floods, it fills this one with water. This one might be okay. So what's this saying is we need to have a heritage management plan of all our infrastructure so that we can balance what was there, what should be there, and how we can protect these wonderful low carbon buildings. And all the time there has been a group of people working behind the scenes to try and help people understand what we're, what we're working with. We realized that as people moved out of the uh, houses, there was a new generation not been inside a shop house, never seen one. And there was also uh, people who were prepared to put modern things on their shop houses, not realizing how they were damaging them. So uh, Chat produced um, the value at your building heritage brochure, which showed the glass versus the shutters, etc. And we went on to do other things. Inside that brochure was a description of what a shop house looked like and how sensibly it was designed. This is the air well that I was talking about earlier. These are the terracotta roofs which actually allow the cool moisture to keep everywhere cool. The front hall traditionally for the Chinese would be where the altar was and the family photographs of the ancestors. And inside would be uh, the second dining hall and the kitchen. That is a terrace we were talking about earlier, and then the rooms on the upper floor. And as we were doing this, we were finding out more and more about the properties, and we wanted to share more and more. So why, where would you share this sort of information? The coffee shop, the most sensible place you could be, because it's everybody is in there. Um, and they were actually written, I think, in English and Chinese, so that uh, other people could, um, as many people as possible in this, Chinese dominated city could actually understand them. And they're still there. These are quite recent, these photographs, and they're still there today. A quick look at how smart these buildings were. Okay, the raised five foot way, we talked about flooding. If you think this is a swamp, then these walls and the floors are like the roots of a tree. The tree roots go down, they find the water, they suck it up. And that's exactly what happens here. But if you manage it well, you can have that to your advantage. And so by putting a lime concrete base and then a terracotta floor on top, you're actually pulling up gently and managing that groundwater. And then you allow the air to flow through and it can evaporate so that it's not um, too much water, and it's too swampy. The kitchen at the back is open to the elements. 
And upstairs you have lattice work above your timber partitions that allows the air to flow through. The hot air comes out of the air well and the cooling rains come in. The problem with these, uh, these rooms of timber work is that you can hear everything anybody does, so there's not much privacy there. Here we show the air wells. Now, if you fear that you're going to be trapped in with all these bars, pass wisdom to smart. There'll be one or two that you can just twist and pull out so you can escape in case of fire or you're running away from somebody, whatever. But it, it does allow you to be protected, but there's a chance that you can escape when necessary. This is what the air wells look like uh, in a group. Some of these houses would be another air well and another building. They can be tremendously long. What happens here is the rain comes in, it goes into this sink below the air well, which is a lower granite area, and then it is piped through to the front of the house. And the guy that was trying to pump out his water didn't realize that the road water was now coming back in up this same pipe. So that was his issue. He was pumping out, but it was going back in. So we have to lower this road even more. Just to let you see what it's like inside, when you're inside. And Salma wanted me to take a picture when it's raining, but it hasn't been raining, so I haven't been able to, I'm afraid. But it is beautiful. I can still sit here when it's raining, and it just comes straight in. It doesn't blow over this staircase, except perhaps once or twice a year. So they knew when they put the staircase there that it was fairly well protected. Um, there's a lot of light comes in. I don't need to put any lights, switch it, any lights on in the day. And there's plenty of ventilation from uh, these air vents above the windows all the way through. It's a very pleasant and healthy environment. This is the kitchen area at the back. Um, again, we've got open air here. Uh, the terrace is above this point, so that's a single story. Above where I'm standing is the bathroom, but there's another bathroom, this little unit here. And this was probably built in the 1950s, um, but the, the system would have been the same. You have a brick reservoir, and in there the rainwater falls, but part of it is inside this building. Um, and you are inside bathing in privacy, scooping up the water all over you, um, and then the rainwater can just top it up. Apparently, you can also, if there's a light inside, you can see the, the image of the person in the water, but that's for cheeky children to find. You notice yes. this is a wrap up pretty soon. Okay, no problem. You notice this is this uh, colored blue. Well, the reason for blue and the reason for lime wash is that it is um, antiseptic, antifungal, and um, there was another uh, I've forgotten for now. But uh, you can pour the lime water from the bag of lime putty. You mix it with warm water and a powder. And you don't freak out when you see it's like this, because this is how it is. The first couple of times you paint it, eventually it dries out like this. It's a very in, uh, healthy environment to live. The terracotta floor will give you a shock to start with, because the salts from the swamp may come up. But over time, they will disappear. And Conservation, one has to understand you have to let the buildings adjust because they've gone through major changes. The biggest change will be taking away cement, uh, which gets, has been put on over the years, and carefully replacing it with uh, a weak plaster to start with, which you take off, and then you put it on back again the three layers of the lime plaster. Sometimes you'll see salts coming up, and that can tell you that there's a problem, you didn't desalinate properly, or you've still got a damp proof uh, membrane in your floor, which is pushing the water into the walls. Just to show you how we actually make this lime putty, we take a burnt limestone or a crushed limestone powder, we put it into a tank like this, it boils like crazy, and you have to gently agitate it so that uh, we can, over time, several months, it'll turn into this. And this is your lime putty. So it's actually very easy to make from uh, materials around you. We also, um, sorry, Salma, I won't be that long. <laughs> we also wanted to find out um, from the past how the water was managed. And we found this plan. We found the well on the plan. We dug up 
the concrete and there is the well. And this lady was the first manager, general manager of Georgetown World Heritage Office. We persuaded her to let us put these plans onto Visions of Penang website, which we set up. So other people can learn from that as well. And here is the uh, well as it is now. From the same site, we produced these four brochures so that we could share the materials and understanding with people. Um, and this was written in three languages, uh, Malay, which is the national language, Chinese and English, pointing out all different parts of the building related to the materials. So timber, stone, clay and lime, again to share. The problem is these are now out of print, although you can download, download them from the website. We also filmed so that more people could actually see what was happening when a shop house uh, is restored. This is yet to be completed. And then our dear friend put together an amazing book, which was, um, it took him 20 to 30 years to photograph the site. As you can read here, it was a lot of work, five years to analyze and one determined person. And in that book, he, get, he helped us understand how the buildings evolved. We learned that the clay bricks and lime mortar were to the 1900s and then the cement came in with the reinforced concrete. We learned that the finishes changed. So the early finishes were more uh, porous, which is what we need for these buildings. And then cement came in and caused us a few problems. So they're quite beautiful materials. Then with all this information, we thought, gosh, we can save every building, no problem at all. So we found uh, two that were clearly this Southern Chinese shop house style. And we thought we, we did a montage of what they could look like as a neighbor with the air flowing through the vents, et cetera. And all the materials it sh we should have had a very successful uh, piece of conservation. This is what we got. So now these uh, air cons have gone. So I think the business is closed following COVID. Somebody else's translation of heritage. Glass means air conditioning. Where do you place your air cons? Added an extra story because actually these two were the same height. So this is still the most successful building. And then the hoarding covered this one and we were worried what would happen, but the owner of this one has respected it, thank goodness. So those books and booklets were useful. We do have some successful uh, buildings, uh, projects, and these are community projects, a Chinese community, a Catholic church, and an Indian Muslim tomb. They have used all the correct materials. But the most vulnerable is what you do with these shop houses, the vernacular. They're very hard to turn into anything without causing them major problems. If you have uh, hotels, you want um, internal bathrooms, which is a concrete slab and piping on top of uh, your timber floors, when the bathrooms would have been just at the back. So this is our big challenge now. The streets were absolutely vibrant with people. There were several families living in these shop houses, not just one. And so we tried to do um, a regeneration project with Penang Heritage Trust, mm -hmm. their office is just here. And this was to turn these houses into different types of unit. Unfortunately, the state government we were asking to buy it, didn't buy it. And um, we ended up being a boutique hotel, which is sad. One almost last thing is several years later, Penang Heritage Trust again found properties for sale. And from the government and ask them to turn it into uh, affordable housing, affordable units for artisans like this who are losing their places because of the wall paintings and the re rising rents. Halfway through the project, it changed completely. We found this advertised on Airbnb. In came the air conditioning. He wasn't allowed to apply. And the type of craft we get are actually made in Kuala Lumpur, the capital. The drains are covered. And there's no room for the hawkers. This was well-known Hawkers Street. So we really need to support the past local wisdoms. Let everything be airy and open and shared. Work with the climate and work in the shade. Now, just two more. We have a chance to return to a low carbon site. I am standing on the minaret of a local mosque, looking over the World Heritage Site. We can see that these are lime plastic buildings and we can open up these drains. It is possible. If not, we have to battle with this. This is the other side of that same minaret. Does this type of architecture and building give us a resilient future? Or should we go back and explore how we can claim this so that we have 
have a chance. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Green Jenkins. And uh, there are a few questions for you. Um, I think many people were very engrossed by the visual, very rich visuals that you have in your talk. And uh, maybe some of that information is already in the visuals. Um, but uh, these, are, these are the questions. The first question is, uh, please say more about the roofing, the towels versus asbestos or, or metal. Okay, um, these tiles are the small um, V tiles made of terracotta and terracotta is absorbent. So they will absorb the moisture uh, during the day, especially in the humid tropics. And it will just slowly allow the moisture to um, keep the uh, atmosphere cool. Asbestos tends to, well, A, it's dangerous to have it on your roof, especially when it deteriorates, um, but it also uh, heats up. The same with concrete tiles. There was a fashion for these old tiles to be replaced with concrete tiles, um, and they actually uh, will cause you a problem. They hold the heat in and they pump it out at night just when you want to be cooler. We have no problem getting owners to uh, swap to the V tiles. That's, I thought that would be a big challenge, but a lot of them are actually quite happy to put the new V tiles on, especially when we had a, a series of grants. So that has been very successful, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, uh, well, the next question, which is related to this one, when making repairs or rehab rehabilitating the shop house today, how easy or difficult is it to find both appropriate materials Line, for instance, and skilled craftsmen to craft people to do the work. Are there any training programs in place for traditional building repair? Well, finding the lime is no problem because, as I showed you with the lime uh, water um, for lime wash, it can you can buy it ready in a plastic bag. But unfortunately, then you have the plastic, so it's better to buy in in the paper bags, which was the um, when we slaked what's called slaking the lime putty ourselves um, and that you have to buy in large quantities but that's if we have enough people to get together we can actually make sure that that can actually happen there are more and more people who are interested in doing this uh, the repairs in this way because we have a lot more uh, had a lot of help originally gtwti um, had a lot of workshops they have one or two now but not so many um, and they we have contractors from that era who can do that work. There are a lot of people who like to cheat a bit. They would do white cement instead of lime because it's the right color. But in the end, you then get the problems again. So the materials aren't a problem. The, these are actually a tile that's made in Malaysia. So that isn't a problem at all. And we are building up uh, skilled craftsmen, definitely. But we always need to build up more. Yeah. OK, the next question is that uh, given the amount of rainfall, how do you keep lime wash from washing off? I guess this applies to the exterior walls. It does. It actually doesn't wash off. Uh, what tends to happen is you will get, if it's a rough lime wash, you'll get a bit of algae. Um, and there used to be, in a, one of our building codes, we had to re-lime wash every year. Um, that doesn't happen now. But yes, it won't be your super, super shiny building as in your condominium or your terraced house or your or landed house, um, it has a patina from the weather, but you can do it every few years. And as it's a healthy material, it is not a problem. It's also very cheap. That blue plastic bag is about three ringgit Malaysia, um, which is to do the same amount with the tin of paint is about 80 ringgit. So it has, it's actually a very cheap material to use. Okay. Actually, I should um, read out the names of the people who ask questions. I'm sorry that I didn't do that earlier, but uh, I'll start to do that now. Uh, the question from A. Narumon is, uh, tourism development can be good for heritage protection, but how do we keep the balance? You mentioned about COVID being a uh, period being a good time for reviewing past development. So what should be our next concrete steps for Penang as well as for other places? In Southeast Asia, it's quite an open question, but maybe just keep it keep the answer short. Okay, it is a very serious question, and <laughs> and it's a one that is five five seconds here. I can't answer it, but.
but we have a breathing space. We now have a lot of local tourism, which is really nice um, to see that local people are enjoying Penang. Um, they come from other states to be with us. So I think local tourism to be um, encouraged. I think uh, the, also the tourism industry needs to get together and help each other so that we don't get uh, overwhelmed with too many crazy ideas and, and over enthused. But this island is so enthusiastic, it jumps on every bandwagon going. And it's, uh, the energy is incredible, but sometimes that energy can just be going in the wrong direction. We need better, perhaps um, now we've got chance to reflect and see how to better manage. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think it's also been a breathing space for natural conservation. And, uh, but on the other hand, you know, there are also things happening when there's nobody to monitor. So I think that that is a common problem that we have. Okay, the next question is uh, from Professor Johannes Widodo. Uh, thank you for a very insightful and informative presentation. Local wisdom, which is embedded in the architectural and urban practices that we inherited from the past, need to be disseminated and passed on to the next generation how to make our millennial generation, general public, educational institutions, everyone uh, fall in love again and willing to be to embrace these systems for resolving the present and future issues. So more about the will of people to actually uh, embrace these systems and to use it for, uh, pro for solving our problems. Well, I, I hate to say it, but some of our new cafe culture uh, which is usually set behind a glass door and aircon, is bringing in different people to the inner city to see it and to start to get to enjoy it. Um, we have uh, urban sketches group who go around um, sketching the environment. They're now 60 or 70 members, um, and there were very few of us in the beginning. So more and more are uh, learning to love. The big problem is getting more and more people to learn to love not having a car. If we can get rid of the cars, we can protect our environment. And that's the next big challenge because then we can also bring them into the inner city. They can live in the inner city. Everything's around them. During the COVID lockdown, major lockdown, everything I went to every day was still there. But in the suburbs, it wasn't. It was a lot harder for people to live uh, in that period. But for me, it was just there. It was still, still happening. I think... Uh... It's surprising, you know, how many of these heritage buildings have been turned into hipster cafes. And so you get new people, young people, yeah, exactly. you know, looking, looking at um, all these uh, walls, lime wash walls and thinking, oh, this is, this is the way to do it. Okay, the next no, question is, Prof. Okay. Sorry. I was just going to say, they're looking at the bare brick wall. Bare brick wall is the latest fashion. The big horror is that they seal it so that it doesn't crumble. And that ceiling is like the sealant that they use is the same as the cement. It is going to do a lot of damage. So uh, there is one place where the, the crust of the brick is bulging out like the top of a loaf of bread. And it, you just want to go and poke it. <laughs> it's just so amazing. And that's in a hipster cafe. So it looks raw and natural, but it, it isn't it really. It isn't really, because they painted it over. Yeah. Yeah. Silicon, yeah. yeah. Um, a, a question from Frauke Kras. Thank you very much for your insightful lecture. Many lessons to be learned and uh, great documentation and inspiring ideas. Two questions. What should be done to turn planners and residence lines towards a renaissance of climate adapted shop houses and town buildings in general? What kind of discourse among stakeholders is needed to revitalize the past local wisdom? That's a big one. Again, uh, Penang Heritage Trust has been involved in that in many, many years. I think the tide is changing. There's an interest in heritage, but it's uh, interest in living in heritage is what we have to encourage. Um, I know a fantastic conservator who won't stay in an old building because she doesn't like them, but she'll restore them and do a brilliant job too. Um, but I think there are more and more that are, are interested. It's no longer, I don't think it's possible to to, uh, because the rental is so high to actually one family lives in uh, a shop house um, that has been bought by a new owner. If they're owned by a clan, then the rent will be lower. Um, so, and they are still living there. But it's possible to share 
And there was one shop house that had 16 young people in there. They set up this little indoor market selling soaps and things like that. Unfortunately, it didn't survive because of, uh, there was no tourists anymore. Um, and it wasn't in the best spot for them. But the idea was there. That, and they were young people coming in that had that idea. And they are the ones we should encourage. Uh, with uh, all sorts of things. Those four brochures, I think now should be put uh, not online just as a PDF, but they should be an Instagram. So that, um, you know, it's much more accessible even to the guys uh, on the building sites. And with Instagram and Facebook, it translates. So you can go from uh, whatever language if the original is in Bahasa Malayu or whatever, it can in instantly translate. So I think we must be much more um, hands literally have the information in your hand which is your phone and that's where we must go okay uh, the next question is from jay sharma uh, accepting all you say about the value of past wisdom that you persuasively advocate for <laughs> first question what are some of the main barriers or challenges to the more resilient to the more resilient future and is it political economic lifestyle population or other densities and question two, how can we best overcome these barriers? I, the, for me, the most uh, difficult barrier is getting people out of their cars because the car is a sense of self-worth. You've achieved something. You've, you're bigger your car, the more important you are. Um, you know, if we could get people to walk, in, and there's a lot of cycling going on now, which is fantastic, but there are still a lot of cars being used. When you have a car, you need to cover over the drains because otherwise you can't park so well. Um, also, they are causing a lot of problems. I can't remember what was your second uh, question. There. Oh, how to overcome the barriers. <sighs> Continue to uh, have discussions, to, to do a sample area, to persuade um, of a sample area. When I talked about the heritage management plan, we were so close to actually getting that for the drainage, we were very close to getting that done. We had the funding, we were told that we the council would not do any drains for a year, they would uh, learn, and then they would have a project after that. Um, and then everything changes, you know, that's there's constant change. But the, the thing is not to exclude our big problem is we work in silos, the best thing is to bring everybody together. Um, so that we, uh, even if you may not agree with them, you bring them into the discussion so that you learn what their anxieties are, and then we can, we can try and, and work together. Thank you. In fact, I remember the time when a lot of life was taking place in the streets. When you didn't have so many cars, a lot of things can happen in the street, and that doesn't happen anymore. So we really should all go back to walking and cycling. Yeah. Uh, Question just, from Lisa. Sorry, question from Lisa Skiller. Hi, yeah. Ben. Fabulous presentation. Lisa, do any of the tiles get made by the local community as creative venture for the floors, etc.? Okay, from Melbourne. Lisa, yeah. Right, uh, Lisa and I were at the same zero carbon um, Intbao conference last year in Pakistan. Um, so we learned a huge amount from that amazing conference. Uh, no, the tiles are not made locally. And if you think of uh, Penang was actually a transshipment port. So everything was made and shipped in there. They have a great network for shipping. So uh, actually, I'm a little bit wrong. The cement tiles began to be made locally. Uh, there's a famous guy, Hutenberg, had a factory, wasn't it, right, Salma, who actually made that. These tiles we get from Vietnam, we also get from China, but it's actually quite a dirty industry. So China is closing down all the polluting industries, and it means that we are um, not getting, we have to relook our sources for this terracotta tile. These tiles, the encaustic tiles, came from the UK, and that was around about the late 1890s to the early 1900s, very fashionable to bring in both cast iron and in these encaustic tiles and these ones later from the, from the UK. These got made locally and now I think the clay mosaic is probably a local design as well. So it's this cutoff point, what we brought in and, and what we imported. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, a question from an uh, anonymous person from <laughs> Myanmar, I would like to say to ask you about the reason to conserve and preserve. Some colonial heritage in Myanmar is threatened to be knocked down. 
This is because of lack of incentives to repair. They don't want to repair using a lot of money, instead want to build new. Therefore, what can be the incentive for residents to conserve and keep authenticity in Georgetown? And how did the government support for the residents or owners? Um, although that was the beginning, the very beginning. I'm not going to go back to there. I'm just trying to find something, but I'm not finding it very well. Anyway, the reason to conserve is why throw something away? It's here already. Um, it's uh, other than the fact that it's lost all its floor, uh, its uh, wooden floor. I mean, the, the, the structure is there. Um, and it's this material actually helps the environment. The lime is uh, absorbing CO2 as it hardens, whereas cement will pump out CO2. So that's actually not good for us to live in a cement building or work in a cement building. So it is much healthier, but it's very hard to persuade people to do that. So the best way is to find, this was a fantastic tenant, a fantastic owner that allowed us to film this and to uh, use the material for lectures like this. Um, and then we've shown so many people this site, so they've learned a lot from it. And that's really the way to go. To me, I hate waste. We have food waste now we talk about, and we try and recycle things. Why not recycle a building? And why build a building that's speculative, that you don't know what its use is going to be? You can restore this and let it to sharers or whatever. It's here already. Why destroy something that's here? And that's going to produce your low carbon site. We, we have only about two minutes left, so we will have two last questions. One is by uh, Najib Arifin. Uh, what reasonably or practically acceptable legislation could be introduced or suggested to promote low carbon wisdom, architecture, conservation, lifestyle? Um, I'm not sure about legislation, but there's a lot of uh, movement. We had high rises going up, which were called green buildings, and I'm not quite sure why they were green, um, but that was definitely the language has been used all along. Um, I'm just reading this again, effort by local architects. Well, it's very interesting, but they, there are local architects who are brilliant and they're local architects who just don't get it, um, which is why we produce these brochures, because there will always be people who work for the architects who don't get it, who are interested and they want to find out more, but they don't ask their boss. So if you have information that they can get from other sources, they can quietly learn on their own and, and put their ideas forward as well. So um, we have to have many ways uh, of actually solving the same problem, the one problem. And actually Science Society has published an excellent uh, book, you know, on, on the legal aspects of uh, conservation and, you know, the the laws that you can use, the laws and regulations you can use to actually advocate conservation. Um, the last question is by Suhardi Hatono. Um, ah. <laughs> has there been any effort by local architects to use those traditional building materials and climate responses spatial organizations in designing contemporary residential or public buildings? Um, not that familiar in this country, but I think uh, definitely overseas, there's, there was an amazing one, a building, I can't remember, it was in Middle Europe, where the building didn't actually have to be heated, um, uh, even though it's in a cold climate, because they had really thick masonry walls and they used lime plaster and they put it in the direction of the sun, uh, which was suitable for the building and the body heat from the people actually kept the place at a really nice temperature. Now, I think we're just beginning to start to realize that we could actually do that here. But as always, it depends on your client. It depends on the money. And we try very hard to persuade people to, to think about these buildings in this way. It's an uphill struggle, but it's one we're not gonna stop. And I, I definitely has become much more the language of um, the architects association and the architecture schools. I was really after Zuhadi and I are at the um, the Borobudur Conservation Unit uh, Office webinar this week, and they've been talk about natural materials for preserving wood, etc. And I was really heartened to hear that our local university, in the housing, building, and planning department, has been looking at the same thing. So this is amazing you just have to network and see what's going on it's happening in small areas and it's time for us to sort of 
get those tentacles out and start talking together. Okay, thank you, Gwyn. I think we have to uh, draw the questions to a close. Um, okay. I'll just maybe just comment, but not. we don't have time to answer them. But uh, <laughs> uh, Frauke Kraus said, the uh, old materials of heritage houses in Germany are resold at high prices. They're authentic, often of good quality, usually from natural and not artificial materials. There was a question, uh, why is the width of shop houses the same in Georgetown? It's because of the assessment that was um, levied for every 20 feet. And then the prop, uh, from the admin, the proper preservation of old shop houses is costly. Lots of owners are reluctant to engage in them. The, the, uh, does Georgetown provide incentives? We had a, a grant program, but that grant program is over. So there were some shop houses that were restored during that time. Uh, some. Um, and okay, so I would like to also say that actually uh, there are many, I think, um, cities which have similar architecture as what uh, Green has shown. And these, uh, these houses, uh, whether they're shop houses or indigenous houses or other types of, you know, old traditional houses, traditional heritage houses, they actually represent uh, embedded energy. So these, this energy is already embedded, you know, it's the old timbers, the old materials. And now construction is responsible for a lot of carbon emissions. I think something like a quarter, I've even seen an estimate of one third. So if you include transport of the construction materials and all that. So it's really, really something that we need to think about deeply instead of just like building more things that, you know, like apartments that nobody lives in or building more concrete and, you know, covering the whole planet with impervious, uh, what do you call it, impervious materials. So um, just to um, come, call it to a close, um, please follow our Facebook page. Citra has a Facebook page. Please like our Facebook page and get the news about the next uh, episode of Cha Time. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. These will, the, the talk will be uploaded on the YouTube channel so you can watch it again and recommend it and viral it. And thank you for joining us very much. And another round of thanks to Dr. Green. I'm sure she can't hear you clapping, but you're clapping, right? And please keep <laughs> safe during thank the time you, of COVID. Thank you. <laughs> during the time of COVID, and thanks to the organizers, uh, Sicha, and especially Science Society, which is the Secretariat to Sicha. Thank you very much. And please join us again for the next session. Thank you.